Give me that name. You got it. I'll take your uh, cupcake. Okay. Yeah, shoot it to me. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I am Rebecca Price with the Nashville Public Library Special Collections Division, which is right upstairs on the second floor and home to two of Nashville's beloved community spaces, the Civil Rights Room and the Votes for Women's Room. If you have not visited those spaces yet, I invite you all to return, to return and explore these places that tell stories and share experience of Nashville's rich and diverse history. I want to welcome everyone to Nashville Public Library for this evening's fourth program in this series, Then and Now, the History of Nashville's Minority Communities, presented by Vanderbilt University. Nashville Public Library Special Collections is honored to host this series and are thankful to all of you here tonight and for those watching live on YouTube. Please remember to validate your parking ticket if you parked in the library garage, which will validate up to 90 minutes. The validation machine is located at the main circulation desk in the lobby. And please be mindful that we are recording this presentation. Before we begin tonight's program, let us be reminded that we occupy the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, Chickasaw and Creek Nations. We would like to honor all the ancestors of this land on which we meet today, from the elders who have gone before to the generations to come. It is now my pleasure to introduce Vanderbilt's Dr. Andre Churchwell with us tonight in his role as Senior Advisor to the Chancellor on Inclusion and Community Outreach. Dr. Churchwell. Thank you, Rebecca. This has been a great run, and I want to thank Rebecca and her team. The special projects are just phenomenal in helping us pull this together. I want to thank my, my team, too, but we'll get to that at the end. Thank you for attending. This is now, as Rebecca said, our fourth then and now the History of National Minorities Community Panel. We're coming off a spirited and emotional event on no November 1st, where the history of our Jewish community was discussed. We're equally excited about today's discussion, the history of Nashville's LGBTQI plus community, then and now. Every community, minority or otherwise, adds to the unique cultural tapestry we call Nashville, Tennessee, our home. In addition, it allows us to recognize the challenges, opportunities, and successes that each minority community has witnessed and faced in their growth and development in this great city and in our country as a whole. The LGBTQI plus community has definitely experienced its unique share of challenges in the past and challenges that are occurring in the ongoing current discussion in our country. Those who've been coming to these events know that we begin with the history of the community being discussed. In most of our sessions so far, there have been multiple books written about those communities, whether it be the Jewish community, African American community here in Nashville, so we're used to having a lot of reference books to use as we build out our discussion. Well, today we must recognize that for this particular community, there are not multiple books residing on the shelves of even this large library, a library on the history of this particular community, the LGBTQI+. So we're fortunate to have our resident historian of the history of the LGBTQI plus community in Nashville with us today, Sarah Calise a metadata coordinator and curator of community histories in the special collection section of the university archives at Vanderbilt University, and the author of a new forthcoming book on this very topic. So thank you, Sarah, for working on that. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge some special guests, but I want to talk about some folks who are missing, who have been very much involved in helping us put this program together people from the Tennessee Chamber. Stephanie Mankey, the executive new director of the Tennessee Pride Chamber, couldn't be with us, and neither could Brian Rossman, 
founder and owner of Dog and Duck and president of the Tennessee Pride Chamber. They have been really major partners in pulling this together. But we do have other guests. I'd like to have Randy talking and Stan, Randy's senior advisor in student affairs and representing the leadership of the LGBTQI plus program at the KC Potter Center. Raise your hand now at Vanderbilt University. You'll hear more about KC Potter and his role here in Nashville at Vanderbilt in Sarah's uh, comments here. We're also fortunate to have the, the leaders of the Vanderbilt program for LGBTQI health at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Delray Zimmerman, please Delray Stan, is director of that program. <laughs> Spectacular work in our community. And Dr. Kevin Niswender, who's our medical director. Kevin, please stand and raise your hand too. But more importantly, I want to lastly thank all of the members of our LGBTQI plus community for coming tonight and sharing with us tonight. Now back to the stage. So along with Sarah, we have spectacular community leadership panel here today. I have to begin by saying, unfortunately, Joseph Interanti can't be with us. He had a fever and cough just right before the program. Joe, as many of you know, is a community activist and former CEO of Nashville Cares. His seminal work for a quarter of a century around HIV treatment was just astounding and led to some major health benefits for our community of uh, people suffering from HIV here in Nashville. So we have to send our prayers out to Joe for a speedy recovery from his uh, illness. We also, but we do have Olivia Hill. Olivia, raise your hand over there. Our first transgender Metro Council member. And as I understand from Sarah, maybe the first transgender member of any elected official position in the state of Tennessee. How about that one? We're just saying here. Okay, we're just saying. Okay. We have... Uh, Marissa Richmond, professor at Middle Tennessee State University and a member of the Metro Nashville Historical Commission and founder of, of, of the Transgender Day of Remembrance in Nashville, a really important day. And of course, I, I, one of the comments, Sarah, I think you and I missed the memo about the Santa Claus hat, so uh, no, we'll, we'll, we'll have to talk about that later. We also have on our panel Jeffrey Ellis, senior contributing editor of BroadwayWorld.com founder of First Night Honors, and co-founder of Query, formerly Dare. Lastly, we have Mac Huffington. Mac with the great green outfit, huh? <laughs> Former president and immediate past president of Nashville Pride and owner of Mac Productions. Now, it is with my infinite pleasure now to introduce Sarah Calise, whose help and work to put this event together and to research this history has been inestimable, and I'd love for her to come up and, and share with you her, this is a preview of her book, The History of the LGBTQ Community in Nashville, Tennessee. So Sarah, please. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight, and thank you to Dr. Churchwell for inviting me to be part of this important program. And a special thank you to Marla Robertson for being the glue that held this thing together during the planning process. And thank you to um, Nashville Public Library for hosting this excellent series of panels. Before I begin my presentation, I would like to make a few remarks about language. If you, like me, identify as part of the LGBTQ community, then you know how much debate there is within our community about words and phrases. Throughout this presentation, I will be using the acronym LGBTQ interchangeably with the term queer. These terms have become widely accepted as umbrella terms. However, when interacting with someone in a one-on-one -on -one setting, it is best practice to use the identities that person requests. Part of the beauty of the LGBTQ community is our diversity of perspectives and experiences. When you respect someone's identity, you are recognizing their life story as valid and worthy. Now let me tell you about Nashville's LGBTQ history. Being a bit of a science fiction nerd, I have sometimes called the study of Southern LGBTQ history the final frontier. <laughs> what I mean by this is predominantly the historical research and archival preservation of queer history in the United States has focused on the East and West Coast, especially cities like New York and San Francisco. Midwestern areas have also been prominently featured, particularly Chicago and Minneapolis. 
we still have much to learn and much to preserve when it comes to queer communities of the South. For too long, Nashville's queer past has been hidden, purposely ignored, and undergone countless attempts to ban its existence. I moved to Middle Tennessee from Gainesville, Florida in 2014 to pursue a master's in public history at Middle Tennessee State University. I completed my degree in 2016. During those two years, I came out for the first time. And I say the first time because you never truly stop coming out. Queer people meet new people or enter new spaces, and we have to evaluate whether it is safe to reveal our true selves. So you see, Middle Tennessee will always be a part of me because Nashville is where this baby gay bloomed. <laughs> I went to my first LGBTQ bar here, the Lipstick Lounge. Yeah, give it up for the Lipstick Lounge. <laughs> um, I had my first queer date at Centennial Park, the same park where gay men spent decades cruising for sex, love, and friendship. The first Pride Festival I ever attended was Nashville Pride in 2017. I didn't know people signed up and paid a fee to be part of the parade. My friend and I just jumped in from the sidelines. <laughs> we saw a group of Cracker Barrel employees. I know, I know, but I love their biscuits. We saw a group of Cracker Barrel employees carrying a very large Pride flag. And something within me said I needed to carry that large flag too. This is the only photo I have from that day, taken on my iPhone 5 and uploaded to Instagram, where it still lives ephemerally. I never would have imagined that six years later I would be a board member for Nashville Pride. An early part of my queer journey was learning about my queer past. Shocking for a historian, I know. Through books and media, notably not school, I knew about a few major historic LGBTQ events, like the Stonewall Uprising of 1969, the assassination of Harvey Milk in 1978, and the tragedy of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s. But I didn't know much else. I especially knew nothing about Southern queer history, which made me feel a deep disconnect with my ancestors. Because not only do I identify as queer, but I also identify as Southern. And queer Southerners are some of the fiercest people I know. And we have always been here, in the South, long before any white man colonized this land. So where is our history? Some of it exists in archives. Some of it lives within people. Some of it is lost for good. I got the idea for the Nashville Queer History Project during the Tennessee legislature's annual slate of hate, in which many politicians waste time passing lawsuits, lawsuits instead of laws. In the spring of 2021, um, conservatives wanted to ban all LGBTQ content from schools, from library books to history texts to sex education. It was one year after the start of COVID after a wave of Black Lives Matter protests, after an increase in unjust labor practices, and after a full term under one of the most outwardly bigoted presidents in US history. I was angry, and the Tennessee legislature fueled my fury. If the Tennessee legislature was going to ban LGBT content from schools, then I was going to put it online for everyone for free. I was an archivist at MTSU's Albert Gore Research Center and I spent the entire summer of 2021 digitizing two and a half years worth of D.A.R.E. newspaper. Nashville's first gay newspaper, co-founded in 1988 by the late Stuart Biven and his partner, Jeff Ellis, who so happens to be one of our panelists tonight. The copies of D.A.R.E. were donated as part of the Out Central collection. Out Central was Nashville's most recent LGBTQ community center. It was open from 2008 to 2018 on Church Street in Midtown. A historically conscious board member salvaged what records they could before they got locked out of the building and being an alumnus of MTSU, donated the records to the university's archive. So there I was at the end of each workday, 
with an aching back from being hunched over a scanner for hours, my fingers covered in black ink that rubbed history right off the pages and onto my hands. And then my hands maneuvered a keyboard and clicked a few thousand times to create a website called NashvilleQueerHistory.org, which then turned into an ongoing oral history project. My first interviewee, Jeff Ellis, of course. The website and those oral histories were then complemented by an Instagram page to share my developing research, which turned into dozens of messages from queer strangers, young and old, saying thank you for sharing our history which led to a book deal with Vanderbilt University Press. All of this by November 2021. Tonight, I will share some anecdotes from the past two years of my research on what it meant to be queer in Middle Tennessee in the 20th century. To study queerness in the archives is to infer, to read between the lines, and to be comfortable with not knowing. To find any Southern queerness before the 1950s is a Herculean task. What we do know often privileges upper-class white people. They had the means to travel, to be educated, and to think themselves worthy of a personal archive that might one day end up in a place like Vanderbilt. And what we do not know is an abundance. There is a lot more feeling than knowing when you study LGBTQ history. Queer historians will look at a photograph and feel its queerness like looking at a long lost queer relative. In both, this, both definitions of the word, queer as in strange and queer as in not corresponding to cisgender heterosexual norms. Take a look at these photographs from the Nell Houston Brown papers housed at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. What a fun group of cross-dressers. <laughs> these photographs were taken in the early 1900s, around 1905, most likely in Gallatin, where the Brown family lived. We do not know much of anything about these people, but they are believed to be friends and family of Nell Houston Brown. Scholar Miki Alicia Gilbert wrote about cross-dressing in Transgender Studies Quarterly. Quote, cross-dressing covers a huge range and can go from donning one or two items of women's clothing, usually undergarments, for the purpose of arousal and masturbation, to spending days or weeks living and performing as a woman, end quote. We don't know the context of these photographs. We probably never will. But these folks definitely look like they're having a queer time. <laughs> Here's another set of photographs, all from the Tennessee College for Women yearbooks. I have researched many early 20th century yearbooks from different all-girls schools across Middle Tennessee. And it is quite common to find at least a couple of sapphic notes, poems, and pictures inside. Again, we do not know much about these images, but even when it is tongue-in-cheek, it is still an act of queerness. One of the few solidified stories we have from Nashville's LGBTQ history prior to the 1900s is the story of Union Army Private Albert D.J. Cashier who was originally born as Jenny Hodgers in 1843 in Ireland. Albert came to the United States during his childhood and settled in Illinois, where he joined the Union Army enlisting as Albert in 1862. Sources say the 18-year-old Albert was somewhere around five feet, three inches tall, with blue eyes and a fair complexion. He fought with the 95th, 95th Illinois Infantry until they were mustered out in 1865. Cashier participated in the battles across Middle Tennessee in the winter of 1864, including the Battle of Nashville. After the war, he returned to Illinois and lived the rest of his life as Albert, who worked various jobs from farmhand to street lamp lighter. He voted in elections and collected a veteran's pension. According to the research of Bonnie Suey, Albert's female genitalia was discovered a few times when he got sick or injured but people did not out him until 1914, when he was admitted to Watertown State Hospital with a deteriorating mind. Staff of the hospital forced Albert to wear women's clothes, and he was investigated for pension fraud. But his fellow soldiers from his unit came to his defense, and he was able to keep his pension. He died in 1915 and was buried in his uniform. 
he was given full military honors at his funeral. Today, several historians describe Albert as an early example of a transgender man. Now let's jump to the 1920s to discuss a couple of queer women in uniform, police uniforms. Nashville's first female cops were Elizabeth Goodwin and Gertrude Whitney, and they were a lesbian couple. Gertrude was born in 1875 in Minnesota, but moved to Cookville, Tennessee, with her parents, Charles and Mary Whitney, in 1887. Her father was a prominent businessman and leader in town. Gertrude was educated in Cookville, particularly in art and music, but pursued a career in social work, which led, which led her to Buffalo, New York, where she met Elizabeth, as they both worked for Traveler's Aid Society. They shared a home in Buffalo before moving to Nashville in 1921 to protect women from various city vices, but mostly, it seems, they saved girls from sex trafficking. They lived together in Nashville at 1230 18th Avenue South, and adopted two boys, Paul and Dan Whitney Goodwin. They left Nashville for Dallas in 1932 and stayed in the area the rest of their lives. Gertrude tragically died from a fall in 1943, and Elizabeth passed away from pneumonia in 1986. Gertrude is buried in Cookville City Cemetery with her parents. Her obituary called Elizabeth a close friend. Their story was recently part of Nashville Ballet's anthology, which explored Nashville's rich local history. I was able to connect ballet director Paul Vasterlein with Elizabeth Goodwin's relatives, who were able to attend the ballet, the ballet's world premiere, and see the celebration of their family's queer love story. We jump time again to the 1950s, when Nashville's first gay bars opened. The Jungle and its neighboring establishment, Juanitas, opened in 1952 and 1956, respectively, along Commerce Street, just a block from where we are right now. The importance of the gay bar cannot be overstated. For decades, gay bars served as community space where men could meet friends, lovers, and eventually fellow activists. Women sometimes went to gay bars too, but they mostly met each other at house parties or through city sports. Nashville's first lesbian bars opened in the 1980s. Nashvillean Marta Revora said this of going to the gay bar back in the 1970s and 1980s. Quote, I usually went with somebody, you know, another buddy or something. I never was uncomfortable. It was kind of like coming home. You know, these are my people, end quote. Outside of gay bars, Men met each other cruising the streets, parks, movie theaters, gyms, and bathhouses across Nashville. Usually these encounters were quick thrills, but in some cases, like that of Jeremiah Mitchum, cruising led to lifelong love. Quote, well, there was the ubiquitous YMCA, Jeremiah recalled in his oral history interview with the Brooks Fund LGBT History Project housed here at Nashville Public Library. He explained that, quote, numerous military people from Fort Campbell would come there for weekends, and there were some permanent residents there too. It was very easy to move from floor to floor by the stairways and meet people from time to time in the showers, or sometimes they would just leave their doors open, end quote. Mitchum met his life partner on the seventh floor of Nashville's YMCA building that was located next to Legislative Plaza in the War Memorial Building. Quote, we clicked. It was amazing. Personality-wise, humor-wise, aesthetics, physically, I knew and he knew right away this was what it was all about. And from then on, he would come to Nashville almost every weekend." End quote. Both gay and lesbian bars and cruising sites were frequently raided by Nashville police. Often arrested men had their full names, addresses, and jobs listed in the newspaper, which ruined their lives. Some chose to end their life. There was a reason LGBTQ people across the country saw themselves in the uprising against police brutality that occurred at Stonewall in 1969. Being gay in Nashville or New York meant living with a certain level of fear and oppression. But we continue to go to the gay bar because that is where community thrives. And that community is something that oppressors cannot take from us. 
In 2018, <coughs> the jungle in Juanitas were honored with a historical marker. It is the second Nashville historical marker dedicated to a piece of our city's LGBTQ history. I want to give a special shout out to writer and local historian John Bridges for his work on this marker's creation. In the 1960s, two Middle Tennessee trans icons were making their mark. Alicia Brevard was born in Irwin, Tennessee in 1937 and grew up on the outskirts of Nashville. She found her way to California and became a female impersonator at the famous Finocchio's in San Francisco. She began her transition under the care of world-renowned gender specialist, Dr. Harry Benjamin, and underwent gender-affirming surgery before returning home to her accepting family in Tennessee. Her family helped her recover and heal from surgery. She then enrolled at MTSU and became a star on the stage. Brevard described her time at MTSU as a wonderful respite, where she felt normal, secure, and accepted. Although, she explained, that the administration was not always pleased with her image. She recalled being asked to come to the Dean of Women's Office to discuss her mini skirts, mesh stockings, and spiked heels. The Dean told Brevard, quote, we're a conservative campus here, and well, you're just not, end quote. Brevard scoffed at the Dean's remarks and refused to let such attitudes phase her. Quite the popular student, her peers nominated her to run for the Miss MTSU title and Associated Student Body, um, but she declined both offers. She tried to avoid too much attention and believed the country was not ready for a transgender woman to be crowned Miss MTSU. She left MTSU with a passion for acting, and after a career on film and stage, and as a Playboy bunny, she returned to Tennessee to teach but ultimately lived out the end of her life in California. She died in 2017, and MTSU honored her memory in their alumni magazine. While Alicia was at MTSU, Jackie Shane was tearing up the R&B charts in Canada. Born in Nashville in 1940, Jackie grew up among the Jefferson Street music scene. She began dressing as a girl at a very young age, but the dual oppression of being both black and trans forced her out of the South and into Canada, where she felt at home. Her greatest hit, titled Any Other Way, reached the Toronto Top 10 in 1963. Despite her incredible talent and passion for music, she left the industry at the height of her fame, tired of not being able to be her true self. For a while, no one knew what happened to Jackie. Rumors swirled that she had died, but she resurfaced in the 2010s after a Canadian documentary film premiered. She had been living in Nashville all along. In 2017, she released a compilation album called Any Other Way, which earned her a Grammy nomination. Jackie gave one last rare interview in 2019 before passing away at her North Nashville home. I am proud and pleased to say that I have been working with Jackie Shane's family to honor her legacy here. In, um, next year, our city will erect a historical marker for Jackie. It will be the city's first marker dedicated to a transgender person. The 1970s was a decade of major growth and visibility for Nashville's LGBTQ community. The first gay activist group in their newsletter, The Closet Door, was established in the early 1970s. Copies of The Closet Door are extremely rare. I only know of three, one at New York Public Library, one at University of Southern California, and one at Vanderbilt University. In 1972, that same gay activist group partnered with Vanderbilt's Young Socialist Alliance to advertise Nashville's first gay liberation dance in the Hustler student newspaper. The dance was to be held at Alumni Hall. This caused quite the stir across campus. Dean of Student Life Robin Fuller was particularly displeased with the off-campus group sponsoring such an event and inviting the public. Other students and staff were unhappy as well, as well as members of the public. Fuller told the hustler he received many negative comments about the dance. Nevertheless, 
The dance happened on Saturday, December 9th, 1972, and it was deemed a major success by the closet door. Roughly 150 people danced the night away, and one Vanderbilt student told the crowd he wanted to start a gay student group. An official LGBTQ student group, Vanderbilt Lambda Association, did not develop until the 1980s. Until then, Casey Potter, the Dean of Residential and Judicial Affairs, allowed gay Vanderbilt students to meet secretly in his home. Potter was not out as a gay man during his time working at Vanderbilt, so he understood the students' struggle to find a safe space on campus. In the late 1960s, a student who grappled with his sexual orientation completed suicide by jumping from one of Vanderbilt's towers. Casey Potter found the student, and he was one of the few people that knew of his situation. It was a tragedy that deeply affected Potter and pushed him to help Vanderbilt's gay students. He not only opened up his home, but he also repeatedly brought gay issues to administrative ears. When the AIDS epidemic hit, Potter and students fought to get condom machines installed across campus. After, a Lambda, after Lambda Association formed, Potter and the students tackled the school's discrimination policy to add LGBTQ people as a protected class. An interviewer once asked Potter if he was scared to support gay students so strongly. I mean, didn't he think he would be outed to his colleagues? Potter replied, quote, I had become more gay because of these kids. That's what it amounted to. I didn't give a damn at that point. These kids, they became my heroes, end quote. Today's Office of LGBTQI Life sits inside the dedicated Casey Potter Center at Vanderbilt. He visits campus every now and then, but enjoys his quiet life on the farm outside Nashville. A small band of gay students on the conservative Vanderbilt campus was not the only unlikely group to call for gay liberation in the 1970s. A gay-affirming Christian organization called the Metropolitan Community Church started a con congregation in Nashville in 1972. They built an inclusive community that ran an LGBT center called Compton House near Belmont University. Compton House was open seven days a week from 12 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. to serve the gay population's variety of health, job, housing, and social issues. The church also held Nashville's earliest gay pride celebrations, including the first known public gay pride protest in Nashville. In June 1977, a group from Metropolitan Community Church marched around Centennial Park holding hands with someone of the same sex, using visible queerness as a political act. They also had several signs with slogans like, gays unite, equal rights, and we're not afraid anymore. Park police told them they could not protest with signs, but they were allowed to continue with their pride picnic. More than a decade later, a vocal group of LGBT folks would return to Centennial for a much larger, much more impactful pride celebration. The final theme of Nashville's flamboyant 1970s was the foundations of our drag culture. Jerry Peake opened up the first drag bar in 1971 called the Watch Your Hat and Coat Saloon. Peake's drag shows were popular among gays, straights, black people and whites, locals and tourists. The Tennessean did several stories about Peake's drag performers once they moved to Ember's Cabaret Room in Printer's Alley. Including a six page story on Sean Louie a drag performer Jerry Peek recruited to Nashville from Chicago. Sean, originally from Hawaii, performed drag as a way to feel closer to her true gender identity. She was one of several people that I know of who received gender-affirming surgery at Vanderbilt Hospital in the 1970s. The Tennessean's cover story of Sean focused on explaining, and if I may say, celebrating her gender transition. In their interview, Sean talked about her send-off two days before surgery. The audience at Nashville's cabaret room gave her a standing ovation and many gifts. Her diary entry from that night read, quote, I looked in their eyes as they stood there applauding, gay and straight people alike. 
They have accepted me into their lives as a person. And now there's the future to look forward to, being a woman, end quote. Jerry Peek and his partner, Joe Heatherly, managed the much beloved cabaret on Hay Street until the 1990s. They now live just, the road, just down the road from me and Donaldson and have shared many wonderful stories with me. And they have agreed to donate digital copies of their Nashville drag photograph collection to Vanderbilt University. We are nearing the end of my talk tonight. Our esteemed panelists will be able to tell you more about the 1980s and 1990s as they lived it. The two-day Nashville Pride Festival you see today that attracted an estimated 125,000 people this year started out in 1988 with about 150 people as they marched from Fannie Mae Dees Park to Centennial Park. The planning for this milestone event began with the lack of government response to the AIDS epidemic and the subsequent 1987 March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights. A group of Tennesseans came back from that march with a fiery passion for, so for political and social change on a scale never seen in Nashville before. The Tennessee Gay and Lesbian Alliance formed, they gathered regularly at the gay bars like the Gaslight Lounge, and planned various public acts of protest, including that first Pride Parade held on June 25th, 1988. I'm glad to say there is much more to tell. To learn more stories, please visit NashvilleQueerHistory.org or follow us at Nashville Queer History on Instagram and Facebook. You can also follow my journey as I finish up the first ever published book on our city's LGBTQ history for Vanderbilt University Press. It is expected late 2024 or early 2025. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy our panel of LGBTQ leaders. We're glad we're taping this. This is going to be in the archives at the Gene and Alexander Hurd Library as well as here at the uh, Downtown Public Library. So this is really important. Uh, I'd like to open up to our panel. <clears throat> you know, this is, all, this is a great time for color commentary and just kind of thoughts that might come to mind. I, th I think Mac is the first <laughs> person I would think would probably have the first immediate reaction to this. This is pretty phenomenal history. Uh, there's a mic right there, Mac. I know as she was talking, I was thinking, I remember a lot of that stuff. I hate to admit I've probably been around that long, especially when she was talking about the first Pride Parade. I was like, oh, I was probably in that parade. So, <laughs> And at that time, of course, very afraid of being out. I was um, in sunglasses and a hat that went down like this. And I think what a lot of people don't know is at that time period I worked uh, for, no, no, wait, not then. But it was when I did work for Vanderbilt, I was so scared to be in the parade, but of course I had my whole production company. They weren't afraid of being gay. They're out marching and, and going and doing, like I said, I'm hiding on the side. And when I did finally decide to jump in, Vanderbilt University with their banner pulled right behind me and started walking. So yeah, I have some memories. Did you wanna? Well. In 1988, oh, Jeff, go, Jeff. in 1988, at the very first Pride Parade, I was the MC, and it was really hot, and there were about as many of you here tonight taking part in the parade. There were a lot of people watching, and a lot of people who were afraid to take part. I mean, they were—you could tell, you could see them on the sidewalks, afraid to join us, and. Um, It was pretty amazing to be there and to see today's Pride uh, Festival is just mind-boggling. Uh, we never dreamed it would be like that. In fact, I remember when they asked me to MC, I said, are you serious? 
do you really want me? And they said, oh, yeah, you're funny. You'll be good. And um, it pissed off my partner because he thought he should be doing it. So, um, <laughs> um, but he died soon thereafter. So, yeah. And I say that as a joke, kind of. So. Well, I'll, uh, uh, when Sarah was sort of running down the list of bars, I actually remember visiting the cabaret. But before that, um, I saw my first drag show at the other side back in, I think, 1977. Um, I was in college, and I was home for the summer, and I was eating breakfast, and I was reading the Tennessean, and there was a story about the Miss Gay Nashville contest, and I nearly spit my cereal out. I'm like... <laughs> I just assumed that everybody was, that people were elsewhere. I never thought that Nashville had anything like that. So a few days later, I went, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a drag show, and I was just mesmerized at how beautiful everyone was. And um, unfortunately, the, uh, they tore the building down only a few months ago. It's now a parking lot. But um, what Sarah didn't mention is that she put together a driving tour, an LGBT driving tour. It's on NashvilleSites.org. Uh, and I was honored to be the narrator. And uh, the other side, the cabaret, the watch and hat saloon, uh, the pride parade, MCC, and so many resources are mentioned in that. And uh, if you have not uh, already listened to it, I hope you'll access it online. Don't try to do it all in one day, um, but, uh, but sort of listen to pieces of it, go out and drive around. And, and uh, she also mentioned, of course, that the marker for Jungle and Juanitas is the second marker. The first was for the late Penny Campbell. Uh, many of us here uh, remember Penny and her contributions. And, um, and so we're, we're really, and being on the historical commission, we're now trying to create more markers uh, like the one that'll go up next year for Jackie Shane uh, to fully document uh, the, the community's uh, contributions to the city. Thank you, great. Olivia, please. I really don't have an awful lot to add. I'm I'm newly out. I will technically be five February the twentieth. So, I it's an I am just continue to be in awe at at the people that I'm sitting here on stage at the Trailblazers. As I look out in the audience, there's so many people here that have have blazed a trail and made it so much easier for folks like me to come out and not have as many hardships as as many have have endured along the way. And I just want to take just a second to say thank you to every single person here that is is been out in Nashville back in the day that made it so much easier for me and all new people here in Nashville. So thank you very, very much. I'm going to see if my guests have any comments. Uh, Randy, uh, Delray, anything to add? Put you on the spot here, Randy. But Delray's going to go first, though. I don't even know where to start. Um, I, I think what was it? Uh, what I found really compelling about your presentation, Sarah, is to learn or, or hear a little bit more about uh, Vanderbilt's gender affirming surgery program in the '70s, uh, because at some point, uh, at some point along the way, that went dormant. Um, and really, really proud of the services we've been able to coalesce. Uh, today um, that have certainly have echoes back from that era. So, um, you know, and two, uh, I'm really proud that you were able to access um, Out Central's uh, collection. I served on that board for six years, chaired it for two, um, and, and I know that archive uh, very well, and so I'm really, really glad it fell into loving hands. So thank you for your, your work. Thanks. Thanks, Del Ray. Thank you. Randy? I was struck by a lot. I was old enough to have gone to Dean Potter's house when people met there. I was a staff member at Vanderbilt, and his role is, is huge in that. And Jeff, I have to acknowledge what you've done. A lot of young people don't realize there wasn't a day you couldn't go to the internet and get information and news. And the value of newspapers at that time was outside of the bars, the only place we could get information. There was no will and grace on television. There was no representation really in media. And so the importance of a local newspaper was so huge. And you and my friend Linda Welch and Jerry Jones, who continued that, who provided us information we couldn't get that was huge. Um, the role of the bars was very important. <laughs> I think, you may remember this, Jeff, that one of my, and by the way, there were bars on Church Street before what happened today. 
And one of my favorite, Midnight Sun um, <laughs> and uh, World's End, the front of their store literally said, all deliveries through rear entrance. And I always wondered if they did that on purpose. That was for people who brought food, by the way, not anything else. Um, but I always wondered, was that intentionally done as a wink, wink, nod, nod? Uh, and I forget about the gas light, so, so happy to hear about that. And at one point in time, we actually had the largest gay bar in the country that was a gay bar exclusively. I learned that. I was in D.C. one time. I went to what I thought was the gay bar. I was standing in line. I kept getting these looks, and I finally realized I was in, in, in uh, town the night it was gangster rap night. Um, so there were bigger bars in the country, but there were different bars, different nights of the week. We had the largest bar in the country that was exclusively a gay bar, which I think was connection number two. So there's a lot of history in Nashville, which is really important to understand um, that, that people have made and paved the way. And again, some people like Jeff, and, and you know, the, to go out and find advertisers who would give you money had to be so, I used to talk about that, right? How you got people to actually advertise in the paper. But that was so huge because that allowed us to stay connected in ways we couldn't connect in any other way. So thank you. Thank you. Great comments. You know, one thing that uh, being a diversity leader and person who's been involved in this stuff for years, what's clear to me, I don't care if it's the black Nashville story, the Hispanic Nashville story, the Jewish or the LGBTQ, to have progress and growth, it takes courage. So you're hearing really stories of courage here on this stage and in this audience. So I just want to make that point. Well, thank you. That's great, Sarah. We're going to move into the next part of our uh, talk here, our, our presentation is to hear some life stories, about five minutes each from our panelists, kind of reflections on their life and the history of the Nashville LGBTQI plus experience. And we'll start with Olivia. You can come up to the uh, podium. Here we go. Don't laugh. You're coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. My name is Olivia Hill, and uh, I'm born and raised in Nashville. I'm actually a fourth generation Nashvilleian. And I grew up the first part of my life feeling like me. I always felt like me. I didn't feel any different. I wore dresses at home. I played with makeup, my grandmother's wigs. I loved to cook and shop and, and just be myself. It wasn't until age 10 that uh, I wanted to start wearing dresses to school. And that's when I got the talk. And I was sent to a psychiatrist in Green Hills to teach me that I had to be a boy and like boy things and do boy stuff. Same time, my mother signed me up for Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, football, baseball, basketball, and every other manly thing she could do to fix her broken child. Because in the mid-70s, transgender was not something that was spoken of. And so that was the start of me feeling like I was broken. I continued through high school, and as I did, every, every girl that I dated uh, broke up with me because I was just a little too feminine. And those that are old enough to remember the 70s, it was a, a real macho man kind of kind of attitude, and everybody who wasn't must be gay. So I was broken up with a lot until I was 20 years old, and I thought, you know, I'll join the Navy because they fixed Richard Gere and an officer and a gentleman, so they can fix me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> needless to say, I was beaten up a lot in boot camp uh, because I was just too feminine. I um, walked a different walk than a lot of the other men. And so I developed a, a, a different persona, and I tried to hang out with all the alpha men that I could and tried to build this thing. I continued on. I, I, worked at, I was in the Navy for 10 years. I did three deployments, two of which in the Persian Gulf. I saw combat in Desert Storm. And then I came back home to Nashville, where I started working at Vanderbilt University. I started at the power plant, uh, shoveling coal and pulling ash from the boilers, and worked my way up to, uh, to running the place. February the 5th, 13th, 2015, is when my mother passed. And that's when I tell everybody my egg cracked. And I no longer had to pretend to be the southern gentleman that she wanted me to be. And I no longer had to feel like I was going to let my mother down. It took me another two years before I finally got the courage to come out. And I came out at the Casey Potter Center to the current director at the time. I worked my way up and I came out to Vanderbilt and I had everything s set up and I scheduled my surgeries and I did everything and then I tell everybody the thing that rocked my world the most in my transition was the loss of my white male privilege that I had no idea that I had until it was gone. And it absolutely positively rocked my world. I have never in my life pre-transition had a grown man walk up to me and correct me 
and tell me that I shouldn't park there or that I shouldn't be driving my car that way or I shouldn't run my car while I'm pumping gas or honey, why don't you smile? You'd be much prettier if you're smiled. I've never been corrected that way in public by so many strangers. I've had to also unlearn so many male things that I tried so hard to try to be me. I got heavily involved in HRC uh, to stand up for women's rights. I got so involved with HRC, I got on their steering committee, I got involved with their governor's uh, convention thing, and I, and I got invited to the convention in D.C. And I went up there, and I was like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to help and fight for women's rights. And the, uh, the first keynote speaker they had was Danica Rome. And she got up and spoke, got the crowd all fired up, and they had a microphone and, and said, if anybody has any questions, and I thought, oh my God, when am I ever going to get an opportunity to speak to Danica Rome? And so I walked up to the microphone and I said, Danica, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you for blazing a trail to make trans people like me come in behind you and be able to help people like you stay elected. And then she put her hand up and stopped me. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> now I've just been corrected in front of about 4,000 people. And she went like this and called me on stage. And when I got up on stage, she hugged me. And she turned me around and basically presented me to the crowd and said, Olivia, if you want to make a difference, become an elected official. Don't help them. And so that was the moment in D.C. in 2021, March of uh, the, the Cherry Blossom Festival, that I made up my mind to run. It was a conversation sitting at a restaurant. I don't remember the name of the restaurant with Phil Cabucci, where we sat and talked about what am I going to run for? What am I going to do? How can I do this? And, and started putting a team together and learning how I was going to move forward with that. Um, and here I am. And I have to give a huge thank you to Dr. Marissa Richmond, who has also blazed a trail for every trans person here in Nashville. I couldn't be where I'm at without her. Um, and I just want to say thank you to all the people that are here that have also blazed a trail for all of us. Thank you. Wow, that's powerful. Uh, this is a good time to add something. Delray uh, Zimmerman has really has been an important force at Vanderbilt in terms of our program on LGBTQI health, certainly in terms of helping us build a program and create the clinic that's been serving people who, who really need support. But Delray brought to our attention that a Vanderbilt student, John Fryer, uh, who uh, finished Vanderbilt in the 60s uh, and kept his uh, gender status kind of quiet during that time, of course. That's the, that's the way it was back then. But when he came out as a professor at Temple University, he was a psychiatry professor at Temple. He actually went to the well of the Senate in the uh, 60s, I think early 70s, and made the case, uh, I, I'm reacting to Olivia, that, having, that being LGBTQI plus is not a mental disorder. And it was because of his testimony at the congressional hearing that the, the psychiatric uh, uh, Society of America took away, struck from their diagnostic uh, list of diagnoses of being homosexual as being a mental disorder. And so we actually have honored uh, Dr. John Fryer by having his picture in our major amphitheater where all the students that come through Vanderbilt and people who visit Vanderbilt can see John, John Fryer and his and the important work he did. So thank you, Delray. Thank you. Man. Marissa. Marissa, <laughs> hard to follow, Olivia. Yeah. Thanks for not calling my name. <laughs> oh, you're going to clean house. <laughs> I get five minutes to summarize 30 years. <laughs> um, well, um, it's, it, first off, thank you all for being here. Thank you to everybody who's helped put this together. Um, you know, growing up in Nashville, um, I thought I was alone, I thought I was isolated, um, and like I said, it wasn't really until I started finding the bar scene uh, that I realized there was a community here, although it was many more years before I really started to connect, since I was actually in college uh, in Massachusetts and then lived in California and D.C. for a number of years. And so when that first Pride Parade took place here, I was actually living in Washington, D.C., but I started my coming out process in the district, 
um, uh, through the bars there, Ziegfeld's, uh, which has now been replaced by the Washington Nationals Baseball Stadium. Um, but I have a lot of fond memories, except for that one night my purse got stolen. Um, uh, but um, uh, that, that was really awful. I had to climb over in my apartment, uh, and I was five floors up, and had to climb over the balcony through my next door neighbor's place so I wouldn't have to pay $25 key fee. Um, <clears throat> but, um, um, but when I finally did move back to Nashville in 1992, um, uh, I, I started getting involved uh, as a leader in the transgender community. At that time, there were no support groups uh, in the Nashville area, and uh, I was one of three people that started the Tennessee Vows, which still exists today, providing support for transgender people coming out of the closet. Uh, and over the next several years, I started getting involved more and more directly in politics, uh, first through the Tennessee Transgender Political Coalition, uh, where we fought for trans inclusion and in legislation, including Metro Nashville. Uh, and I had people tell me to your, my face, it's not your time. And I would just say, well, how many of us have to get killed before it is our time? Um, and, uh, and there was just some very ignorant, hateful things that I had to listen to, that I had to fight against, uh, to fight for inclusion, to fight to make sure that all meant all. Um, uh, and of course, I also got involved in the Democratic Party and actually got elected uh, to the Democratic Executive Committee in 2008. And I'm proud uh, that I put my name on the ballot and ran and served four terms in that particular position. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and I was joking with uh, Council Member Hill, and you have no idea how thrilling it is for me to be able to say that. Council Member Hill. Let's... <laughs> But um, uh, we were joking in the reception. She's like, you know, you're, you, you know, when are you slowing down? And every year I, I give myself a resolution to slow down. And then every December I sort of look back at my year and say, well, I'm falling a little short of my goal. And, uh, and, and sadly, when I, uh, when I, well, maybe not sadly, when I post my end of the year review in a few weeks, uh, once again, I'm going to fall short of my goal. Um, even though I technically retired from teaching, finally, after 31 years in the classroom, um, uh, I'm still serving on five boards and commissions, um, and uh, although two of them will expire in April and one next October, um, but, but I'm thrilled to be doing these things. And as far as that particular one in October, uh, those of your Facebook friends have seen my photos and share some of the stories I shared about it. But earlier this year, I was honored to be appointed to the Commission on Advancing Educational Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunity for Black Americans by the President of the United States, Joe Biden. <clears throat> so after months and months of ethics reviews, and I told everybody I should have applied for the Supreme Court instead, we finally had our first formal meeting at the White House in late October. Um, we heard from a number of presenters, uh, mostly stakeholders in education. And while this particular commission is not specific to the LGBTQ community, there are two of us on the commission from the community, including our chair, State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta, Pennsylvania. Uh, I got to know Malcolm through the Victory Fund about 12 years ago. And, uh, and he and I are serving, and so there is uh, inclusion. And, uh, and in fact, Malcolm named me to be the co-chair of the working group on civil rights in education. And so uh, we're moving forward uh, to prepare our report to deliver to the president in October. Um, but after the, at the end of the first day of meetings, we were officially sworn into the office by the vice president, Kamala Harris, and by the secretary of education, Miguel Cardona. Um, and then after they left, the president came in to thank us. Um, we got a group photo um, and was shaking hands with them one by one. And when I said, thank you, Mr. President, for this opportunity to serve, he gave me a big bear hug. And I'm like, my God, the president just gave me a bear hug. <laughs> and, um, and then um, after we'd all gotten our handshakes, he said, are y'all busy? Do you have to go anywhere? And we're like, no. So... <laughs> <laughs> Like, you inviting us for dinner? I don't know. I, we didn't know. And he said, would you like to come to the Oval Office? So we traipsed over to the West Wing, and I finally got the photo last week, which I posted on Facebook on, I think, Friday or Saturday. Or no, I posted it Thursday. That's what it was. And, um, 
and so I made sure nobody got in front of me. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I, I'm standing right up front, but I got my hands planted squarely on the Resolute desk. Uh, I tried to claim it for myself, but there was Secret Service around. Um, but uh, 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 several of my high school classmates or Facebook friends and several said, we knew you were gonna make it there. And, and, uh, and, and I tell people that no matter what happens, the fingerprints of a black trans woman from Nashville, Tennessee are on the desk of the President of the United States. And I am... <laughs> and, and I am honored that I left my fingerprints, that those are my fingerprints on that desk. So again, I want to thank you all for being here and thank the organizers, thank Dr. Churchwell and, and being part of this wonderful panel. Thank you. Wow, man, I haven't made it there. There you go. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Jeff, we have an all-star panel here. You know, this, these, this is the all-star of the all-stars here. Here we go. Well, hey, y'all. I'm Jeff Ellis, and when I was five years old, I knew I was different when I fell in love with Adam Cartwright on Bonanza. <laughs> But I had the presence of mind not to tell people. And when I was in sixth grade, someone called me a queer. Now, I didn't know what it meant, so I looked it up. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. And I thumbed over to homosexual, and I read it, and I thought, well, by God, that's me. So there have got to be others like me in the world because the people at Funkin' Wagnalls didn't interview me for this. And that's my story. <laughs> <It's interesting. laughs> um, when I was in high school, I actually came out to friends. When I was in college, I was editor of the school paper at MTSU and came out and wrote a lot of gay stories uh, to the point that my coming out was anticlimactic. <laughs> uh, then in 1987, at a fundraiser for the March on Washington, a drunk lesbian fell into this guy and knocked him to, to, in, to my feet. Well, he knocked him to the ground in front of me. That's the best way to put it. And I thought, well, he's cute. <laughs> and um, he was, get this, a law student at Vanderbilt, which sounded good. And uh, anyway, that was Stuart Biven. And... Um, a year late, well, actually, probably seven months later, we started a paper called Dare, uh, which ultimately became Query when, this is the dishy part of my story, the people from the Drug Abuse Resistance and Education uh, Organization sued us for millions of dollars. We lived in a tiny apartment on Woodmont. And Stuart looked at me and he said, what the hell are we going to do? And I said, we have no money. <laughs> they can't take blood from a turnip. So we went to see our friend, um, um, Hedy Weinberg, at um, the ACLU. And Hedy said, I know a lawyer that um, you should meet. So she introduced us to Erwin Vinnick. Ernick took, Erwin took our case and um, D.A.R.E. was uh, based in L.A. And they were sending a team of lawyers to Nashville to depose us. And we were scared, shitless, quite <laughs> frankly. Uh, and Stuart was panic-stricken, and I said, listen, we have no money. <laughs> what can they do to us? So um, we go in, they depose us, and um, we're thinking, well, okay, what's next? And we got a phone call from the secretary to the head of DARE in um, Los Angeles. And the guy says, I'm gay, and I'm pissed off what they're doing to you. So he then fed us all the information we needed to uh, know. <laughs> in order to get a large cash settlement. 
I'm able to tell you this story because I didn't have to sign anything saying I wouldn't tell. <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier, Stuart then died. And, um, I, and I say that jokingly because it's how I have always dealt with the fact that he died, um, which says more about me than anything else. So you can just think I'm a horrible person. Uh, because I am. But anyway, uh, so they, they gave us a lot of money. We bought a house. We moved our offices. We bought new cars. Blah, blah, blah. And changed the name to Query. And, that, <laughs> and we did that because I like the idea of a big Q on the masthead of the paper. Um, now... Um, since then, you know, it, it's, it's amazing to me because, oh, I should tell y'all, if I get emotional, I'll stop talking for a minute and I'll kind of, you'll, you may think I'm having a stroke, I'm really not. Uh, it's just, it, it's how I am because I like to compose myself and not start blubbering it because I cry really ugly. Uh, and at my age, I cry at card tricks. So anyway, um, we, um, what was, I, I've lost my train of thought now. Uh, so anyway, um, we, uh, when we started the paper, we did it because when Sir came back from the March on Washington, we had just met the night before the March on Washington. And we made a, a well, it was at a fundraiser, as I said, as I said earlier. So Sir calls me, we make a date, and then, like, three hours before the date, he calls and tells me his father died. And I thought, oh, yeah. How many times do I have to be told that? <laughs> and so, actually, his father had died, and I felt really bad. And so then when we finally went on a date, we started talking about what he wanted to do. And this was after the March on Washington. And he said, I want to start a gay newspaper in Nashville because of the experience that he had, uh, had at the March on Washington that was propelled, really, by some things that happened to him while he was a law student at Vanderbilt. And uh, um, so I said, well, you know, I have a degree in journalism. And so we started the paper. And... Uh, over 15 years, I wrote millions and millions of words about the gay community, everything you can imagine. And I wrote so many stories about AIDS that I finally reached a point where I just could not write anymore. And so I stopped doing the paper. So I stopped doing it. But during that time, toward the end, I would run into people. And uh, they would, I would introduce myself, and they would talk to me, blah, blah, blah. And then later they would say, well, I knew who you were when you introduced yourself because I'm not having a stroke. Because I learned about being gay from you. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you how that makes you feel. It makes you feel good, but also it puts so much pressure on you to be better than you are or better than I am. Um, and then, after we, I stopped doing the paper, I continued to review theater. I, and I review theater today for broadwayworld.com, which is the largest theater website in the world. And I am the only theater critic in the Nashville area that you need to pay any attention to. <laughs> uh, and I don't care what those other people say, they can't write like I do. Um, at any rate, um, so I toiled in obscurity, selling men's tailored clothing at Macy's, um, running a Mexican restaurant and a, uh, an Irish restaurant and an Austrian restaurant 
when I wasn't selling suits. And then one day, out of the blue, I get a call from Sarah Calise saying she wants to come and interview me. And I probably said, about what? <laughs> because I cannot tell you how many people that I know quite well who had no idea what I used to do. In fact, when I was at Macy's, I was waiting on a guy one day buying shoes. And people are their worst when they're buying shoes. <laughs> uh, and he, uh, I'm getting some shoes for him. He said, hey, Jeffrey, do you ever get confused with that other Jeff Ellis in Nashville? And I said, well, which Jeff Ellis do you mean? And he said, well, he lived over in Germantown, and he had two dogs, and he ran a newspaper. And I said, well, actually, no, I've never been confused with him because I'm actually him. <laughs> and um, so throughout my later life, people are oftentimes surprised I ever did anything like that. That... We got death threats from the KKK. We got death threats from people who didn't want their names printed. We were investigated by the FBI who rented an apartment on Woodlot underneath us in order to investigate us to make sure that we weren't doing anything we weren't supposed to be doing. And it kind of... It's kind of freaky when you think about it, you know. And now when I'm no longer 30. Um, it's interesting because if I'm seen with a woman, people assume I'm straight. I'm like, well, what the hell do I have to do for you people? <laughs> so anyway, so that's a word of warning to all of you too. You come out from the very first moment you're born until the day you die. Also, when so Sarah calls me, she wants to talk to me, and thanks to Sarah, people discovered that I did something once. <laughs> and, you know, I think that it's, it's one of those things, Sarah, I got to tell you, that all my friends say, why haven't you written a book, Jeff? The Sarah Calise is writing a book. <laughs> and I say, well, I don't have the um, personal... Um, um, I don't have the ability to set a goal and achieve it without a lot of procrastination. <laughs> so I have been writing a book since I was five years old. <laughs> and um, let me tell you, the book has a lot better stories than the ones I'm telling you all tonight. I have some really great stories. Uh, but Sarah came to me, and she, we talked for hours and hours. And Sarah told people what I did. And the thing that really gets me and makes me so emotional is this. There was a time so different from today that wasn't that long ago. And I'm still here. And every person in this room owes a huge debt of gratitude to Sarah for her tireless efforts to keep our stories alive and to make them available for generations to come. And I'll tell you right now, that's a good thing to know. Thank you all so much. Wow, batting clean up. <laughs> Mac Huffington, Mac, please come up. Okay, this is not even fair. That's <laughs> after all that. First of all, y'all put your seatbelts on. Man, <laughs> second of all, I'm the only one that followed any instructions. Uh oh. Because they gave a list of questions, I have my answers. So I have nothing to say like they do. So this, first of all, it's not fair. And then I also want to say before I get started that I too am writing a book. So hold, hold, cause this is, and my book has always been about being gay. Cause when I first started, you couldn't come out. You couldn't tell people you were gay. So I always told people I was married and had five kids. <laughs> and so 
Somebody says, okay, but you have a partner. Like, you have a female partner. You're a lesbian. Because I'm writing a book. And so I had to go undercover, get into a gay relationship, so I can learn about being gay. Okay. Now, needless to say, my partner and I have been together 27 years. And so somebody asked me. Somebody said, when is your book coming out? <laughs> and I said, well, now that marriage is legal, we got to stay gay a little bit longer until we get married. So I'm still waiting on those chapters of the book. <laughs> so then somebody said, well, what about your husband and your kids? I was like, what kind of mother do you think I am? What kind of wife? My husband and kids are very well taken care of. <laughs> I check on them. I, I go see what's happening. Stallion understands, so, but I want to know, my, my book will be out whenever we decide to get married. So she told me, as long as I'm still doing pageants, events, involved in pride, we won't be getting married, so I got time. Yeah. So I, I'm going to try to answer the questions. <laughs> so, so basically, I, well, my name is Matt Cuffington. Um, I moved here um, to Nashville from Chicago, Illinois, where, again, we was not, not only did not gay, didn't know anything about being gay, uh, and probably just like everybody else on the panel knew there was something kind of wrong, a little off about me, because I thought women were fine. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so, you know, like Olivia said, that's not right. I'm supposed to, you know, like the guys. Now, don't get me wrong. Went out on dates. I went on six proms. All very well paid for by the guys. Uh, and so, you know, I, I had my, you know, I had my time. Um, but when I moved here and discovered gay people, like the sun and the sky and the whole world opened up and life was good. People, life was good. Um, and it was so good that, of course, got into the clubs, found out about the clubs. Start going out to the point that I changed my whole school schedule. So, <laughs> because at one time, Monday nights were hot, so I had to be off on Tuesday. <laughs> Wednesday nights were hot, so I had to be off on Thursday. And then you had to go out every Friday and Saturday. And then any Sunday that there was a pageant. So my life was good. <laughs> um, and so again, I was very excited to meet more you know, gay people like me. I felt like I wasn't alone. Um, and then I met someone that wanted to start, you know, an LGBT organization um, with a purpose. And at that time, um, I happened to be at that meeting where we came up with the name for Pride. And it was called My Pride Encompassing Nashville, uh, which, of course, is now um, Nashville Pride. Um, and at that time, I also started my production company, um, because I was going to the pageants and all I ever saw was drag queens. Um, and as I said earlier, I'm a lesbian, so I like the studs, okay? And so we didn't see many studs. Um, at the time, there were two. Um, and so I was like, oh, we, we got to do better than this. Now, queens, love y'all. Mm, love y'all to death, but I, I had to see some studs. Um, and so I decided to start. Um, a pageantry system, um, it's called Mr. Esquire for male impersonators. And then, of course, now the cis girls are upset. So I had to start a pageant for the cis women. Um, and so I have Mr. Esquire and I have Miss Tennessee Diamond Diva. Um, and just started traveling around um, to pageants and events and prides and, and things like that. Um, it just became very connected, very, very much um, in love with Pride, I, I know a lot of people have heard me say how much I love Pride and being a part of the, the community. Um, so I also ended up affiliated with other uh, organizations, National Pride, NASHA, Black Pride. Yes, there's a Black Pride. In case y'all don't know, there's been 20 something years of, of Black Pride. So we also have a Nashville, you know, Black Pride. Um, an organization called Grace and Gratitude, Toys for Tots. Uh, Bianca Page, uh, also one of our legendary queens in Nashville, Tennessee, um, a part of that board, um, as well as, you know, other boards. <laughs> what happened? What y'all do? I wasn't... I should have known. I should have known. Um, and I guess I, before I say anything else, I want to 
um, kind of mention a story like everybody else. Um, like I said, I wasn't out. Um, you know, we snuck around to the clubs. Uh, of course, my first girlfriend was, of course, someone I met in college. You know, we were friends, we were roommates. Um, anytime we went out, um, we'd come back to the dorm and, oh, where were y'all? Oh, we was at Freddie J. You know, whatever was the latest straight club, that's where we had been. But we didn't see y'all because we left and went over to Barney's. I don't know how y'all missed us. We were there, you know, all night long. <laughs> and so we always had our straight story, you know, to come back to. Um, and then uh, I think something else maybe nobody knows. Um, to my knowledge, I was one of the first girls to have a baby for her girlfriend. Uh, my girlfriend, oh, she wanted to get married and uh, have a house with picket fence and, you know, all that. and we did. We, we, we got married, which wasn't legal. I don't know what they, we called it back then, but we actually got married over at the, oh, I can't think of the church. I should be ashamed of myself. First into, uh, yes, thank you, yes. Um, so we got married over there. Like I said, I had a baby for my girlfriend. We had a house and cars and all that stuff. Um, but unfortunately, instead of a stud, she was a dud, so that didn't, you know, <laughs> that didn't. That then I thought I was the stud. And I'm working, cooking, cleaning, putting out, doing everything. So that, yeah, we 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 had to we had to break up and move on. So um, I got very lucky to meet um, who I have now. Um, but one of the other questions was what was like the major concerns and challenges um, affected in the community? You know, prejudice and lack of diversity. Um, I got three strikes. I'm black, female, and lesbian. <laughs> Life hard, y'all. It's, it, it's, it's really hard. Um, but still being part of the community, it helps. You know, we all have our issues. Um, but knowing people experience what you've experienced and gone through what you've gone through, um, this just, it really helps to, to stay a part of the community and stay close um, with folks. Um, you know, now there's more people out, companies, people, companies willing to come out and support, you know, organizations like this that let us, you know, come out and do uh, different things and, and be so supportive and, and give money and whatnot. So um, I hear a lot of the young folks say, oh, we still got a long way to go. Y'all out holding hands, you kissing in public, stuff says gay everywhere you go. Honey, y'all have no idea, <laughs> you know, what, what we went through. Like I said, the hiding um, and whatnot, it, even to the point I've, I've been out several times, um, and you could tell when you're in an area that people are not too happy about you being gay. You're my sister. But, you know, some of you get, oh, that's my sister. Not gay. What are y'all talking about? Um, so, you know, it's a lot of hiding. So life is, it is better now, but we still have to continue to, you know, struggle for our rights. Um, and then it also says, you know, what are our friendly places here? Play, try, canvas, lipstick, the rainbow room, natural care is my house. It used to be the cabaret connection. Not that I know I've ever been to those places. I've heard about them. Um, I, I, I even...
But anyway, um, one of the girls in the group, um, we all got laid off. And literally two years later, I finally decided to tell her. So um, I, I, I love doing this, love being a part. Thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me be here. Um, I don't know if there's a Q&A period, but feel free to ask me anything, because at this point I've probably overshared, so it's all good. <laughs> thank you. Wow, that was phenomenal. I'd like to give all the panelists uh, another applause here, please. <laughs> applause of appreciation. Applause of courage. Applause of great stories. You know, we're looking at the time. We're right at the uh, closing point here. I think Mac answered all the questions. There you go. We have no questions to pose. I would like uh, Sarah to come up and uh, offer some closing comments, please. Just wanted to say thank you all uh, LGBTQ folks and allies in the room for showing up tonight. We need you to keep showing up and I particularly mean at your state and local elections and school boards because I don't know if you've noticed but the fight is not necessarily happening in Washington. It's happening down the street from you and we're losing our rights very rapidly. So keep showing up. Thank you. In closing, I want to thank the panelists again. Thank Sarah for spectacular history, sharing that with us, a preview of her book. I want to thank Rebecca Price and her team with the special projects here at the National Public Library. I want to thank Midori Lockett, who works with us from Vanderbilt, from the Vanderbilt's Government and Community Relations Program to help us get the food here from... Uh, Great. Thank, thank you, Midori. And lastly, Marla Robinson, who is the anchor of, of my office, who helps put this whole thing together. Thank you, Marla. And uh, thank you all for coming. We'll have a little hiatus here over the holidays, and we'll come back again on February 7th, where we'll talk to members of our Native American community. So thank you all for coming. Don't just vote. Make a decision to run. <laughs> <laughs>